Purur-Brahma, Purur-Vishnu, Guru-Devo-Maheshwaraha, Guru-Eva-Param-Brahma, Tasmai Shri Gurave Namaha, Chinmayam Yapyat Sarvam, Trilokyam Sacharacharam, Tadpadam Darshitam Yena, Tasmai Shri Gurave Namaha. Tvameva Mata Chapita Tvameva Tvameva Bandhu Shasakha Tvameva Tvameva Vedya Pravindam Tvameva Tvameva Sarvam Mamadeva Deva Vameva Sarvam Mama Deva Deva Jai Guru. Welcome to you all. So this is our first lesson in Krishna Upanishad. So who do we have online? Do we have any new people online, Mark? No. Okay, so it's all old timers. I did post the link on Meetup. So just be mindful. I don't think we'll have any bombers, but we might. So just be, be aware of that. So we have a, a Shanti mantra that's associated with this Upanishad from the Atharva Veda. Uh, it's the same one we learn with uh, Mandukya Upanishad. So I'll chant it line by line, and you respond the first time through, and then we'll uh, chant it at the beginning after that. So, Om Bhadram Karne Vishwin Vyama Deva. Om Bhadram Karne Vishwin Uyama Deva. Bhadram Pashe Maksha Birya Jatra. Bhadram Pashe Maksha Birya Jatra. Stirai Rangai Stushtuvagum Sastanubihi. Stirai Rangai Stushtuvagum Sastanubihi. Vyashema Deva Hitam Yadayuhu. Vyashema Deva Hitam Yadayuhu. Swastina Indro Vridhashrava. Swastina Indro Vridhashrava. Swastina Pusha Vishwaveda. Swastina Pusha Vishwaveda. Swastina Starksho Arishtane Mihi. Swastina Starksho Arishtane Mihi. Swastina Brihaspatir the Dhatu. Swastina Brihaspatir the Dhatu. Om Shanti, Shanti, Shanti. Om Shanti, Shanti, Shanti. And for any of you who can read Devanagari and want it with what we call the swaras, which tells you when your voice goes up and down, I have a copy of that there. So a little bit about this Upanishad. It's one of the 10 principal Upanishads commented on by Shankara. It's considered, I think, the fourth in the series. It's important. It comes again, as I said, from the Atharva Veda. Uh, it actually is inserted in the Brahmana section. Uh, not the Mantra or the Aranyaka section. 
And uh, the style as it is with all of the Upanishads is in the form of a dialogue between a teacher. Our teacher in this case is Pipalada, which is very interesting because I looked up the meaning of his name. And it's he who's given to sensuous pleasures. That seems like a contradiction in terms here. But one of the things we will look at is what is happiness. So it's another way to say the ultimate sensuous is the one who revels in the self. And in this particular Upanishad, there are six students. And they all come to study with Pipalada and to ask questions. So we also have in this beginning portion, the traditional way in which teachers approach a student and how the student's mind is form so that it becomes available for the highest knowledge. Very interesting stuff. And in the first part of the Upanishad, we have a long discussion about how this world comes about. So to review the three great questions we get in Yoga Vasishta. Who am I? What is this world? And how has it come about? Don't be satisfied just with going on the witness. What happens if that's as far as we get? The world will come. Continue to agitate us. We have to see that the world is Brahman too. And we see in detail how this world has come about. All right, so Puneet, will you help us out with the first mantra? Uh, mantra one. Om Sukke Shacha Bharadwaja Shabdyascha Satyakamaha Saurya Yanicha Garyaha Kausalyascha Scha Layano Bhargavo Vair Vaidar Bhihi Kabandhi Kabandhi Katya Naste Ketai Brahma para Brahma Nishtaha Param Brahman Vesha Manaha Esha Hill Vai Tatsar Vam Vakshatiti Teha Samit Pana Yo Bhagavantam Pipala Pipalada Mupasanaha Sukesha, son of Bharadwaja Satyakama, son of Sibi. Gargya, the, son, the grandson of Surya, born in the Ganga Gotra, Kaushalya, son of Aswala, Bhargava of the Vidarbha city, belonging to the Bhrigu Gotra, and Kabandhi, son of Katya, all of them devoted to the inferior Brahman and centered in the inferior Brahman and seeking the highest Brahman approached the revered Pipalada with fuel in hand thinking that the Rishi would explain everything to them. Okay, so we have here the traditional approach. And these students uh, all come from great Brahmin lineages in old timey days. The Vedanta was only available to those of the priest class. Luckily, we've come to see that being a Brahmin is not jati, how, what your family is, but it's qualities 
of head and heart. Krishna very clearly says in Gita, I am the author of the fourfold caste, Varna, according to Guna and Karma, qualities of mind and our actions. So you may come from a very long, noble, blooded family, have taken the thread and do your Gayatri Mantra at once. And you spend your life rubbing at your money. Just a merchant. Likewise, you may be born from a very poor social uh, class. Or God forbid, you're a Westerner. But if you have a yearning for this, you are according to how Krishna originally says it. So these six students are established in Apara Brahman. Para, of course, means supreme. Apara here means lower. Here we mean they have studied the various dharma shastras. They've uh, decided they are not particularly interested in the world. They've done what today we would call the yamas and the yamas. To some degree, they've acquired the qualifications of a fit student. They're on the path. And they've come to this great Rishi, the sage, Pipalada. And they bring dry wood. So this was the offering you would give to the Guru. Why dry wood? Well, maybe an exoteric understanding so we can keep his fire going. But the deeper meaning is that we have dried up. To a large degree, our addictive relationship with the world, this compulsive extroversion, I must have this, I must have that, give me, give me, give me, give me, give me. It's been dried up to some degree, but we still have our vasanas. So we take these vasanas and we give them to the teacher. We put them at the feet of the teacher. Burn them up for me. Why? Because the fruit of self-knowledge is the burning of all our ignorance. Burning all our muscles. Mind can then no longer extrovert into the world. The way that the mind of the ignorant is. This is a beautiful passage here. All in this first mantra. So the six young men come. Shame we don't have a woman in there, but we can put one in there. It's certainly available to all. We don't need to keep anyone out of the halls of Vedanta. The Vedanta itself 
is its own guardian. There was telling me that the Shankaracharya said something about Vedanta's only available to those who are done with the world or something like that. Yeah. This was the Shankaracharya at the Sringiri, right? No, this was a Swami we met at the land of Dasha. Okay, so so what did he say? He said you come you come to the Vedanta when you're there, when you're done with the world. Yes. You come to the Vedanta when you're done with the world. Very true. So these six students come to Pipalada and let's see what happens. Next mantra. Tanha sa rishir uvacha bhuya eva tapasa brahma charena shraddhaya samvat saram samvat Syatha Yatha Kamam Prashna Prichata Yadi Vignyasa Yamaha Sarvam Havo Vakshyam Iti. To them the Rishi said, quote, Stay here for yet another year with austerity, celibacy, and faith. Then you may ask as you please your questions, and if I know them, I will surely explain everything to you. End quote. So they've come into the life of an ashram, a hermitage with the guru. And no teaching is going to take place for a year. And they're to keep Brahmacharya here, Swamiji's translated as celibacy. It's not just that. Char charity means to roam around. So the literal meaning of the term is to roam around in Brahma. So the value of entering into an ashram is the external stimuli of the phenomenal world are removed from us. So when I was hanging out in the ashram in the hate, we didn't do too much of this sort of stuff. But when I spent several months at the ashram in Mumbai in 93, Go in, all the guys, your head gets shaved except for a little choti, which is your attachment to the scripture, your attachment to the teacher, a little pigtail. Everybody dresses the same. You wear kurta and a dhoti. The ladies, they just wear a white sari. No fashion. You live in a cell. You have a bed, you have a desk, you have a dresser. And we lived out of a bucket, not a rubber bucket. And that's what you use to wash out and clean your room, to clean your clothes, to wash your own body. That's it. Chant. Pray. You start to slow down. This work takes leisure. You think I was going to say it takes work? It takes. Spacious time to be able to think, to meditate, to listen, study. So many of us are under so much vasana pressure. We're just busy, 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 busy. 
when we do have leisure time, what do we do? So four of those things have to die down. It's to be space. And this can take time. Paramahansa Yogananda used to say, ashrams are for weak lovers of the Lord. So if it's hard for us to let go of the world, our prada, our karma, will put us into an ashram where we get the external support to let go. It becomes a bit of a pressure cooker. Now, when I was in the Mumbai ashram in 93, some of these youngsters, all their issues would come to the surface. Talk about a funny farm and crazy and fights and jealousies. And blah, 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 blah. All the stuff that was there when they were in the world and could be disguised by activity, bubbled to the surface. Now we get a shorthand form of that for any of you who've done retreats. So I know you two have. Have you done retreats, you guys? So I'm thinking about a friend of mine who was on a Buddhist retreat, a Vipassana retreat. And while he was there the whole time, he was convinced that one of the cooks, people in the kitchen, hated him. By the look on his face, the way he would behave, to convince this guy hated me. Was it real? But my suspicion because I bet he had issues like that out there in the world. But we can cover them up or hide them or disguise them with busyness. Another thing I've heard happen at retreats, all of a sudden there's somebody you see who's sitting two rows ahead of you and you're intensely sexually attracted to them. Mind you, you've never spoken to them. You've only seen their back. All this stuff comes up. I won't ask you two if you've had any things like this. Have you? Never. That's cool. Then lies come up. But the whole idea is the ashram becomes a pressure cooker. The retreat becomes a pressure cooker. Now, if we are attentive, life itself can be an ashram. I'll tell you how you do that. Here is a slogan, a maxim that will help us use our ordinary lives. It is a spiritual axiom that if I'm disturbed, no matter the cause, I'm the one with the patient, the affliction. I'm the one with the emotion. So the yogi pays attention to her heart. She gets upset. I'm the one. She's talking to the fellow this week. He's a devotee. He's not really much of a yogi yet. But he was at a, 
uh, an ashram in India, and he met this girl. He's a Westerner, she was an Indian. And he developed this just fatal attraction to her. So he gave her all this money for her to do this, that, and the other thing, and went horribly into debt. Now he's on the verge of bankruptcy. And then what does his mind say? It's all her fault. She didn't rob his bank account. She didn't steal money out of his wallet. It was his attachment, their judgment. But what does ego do? She was manipulative. She lied to me. She made me spend all this money. You did it. Nobody has the power to make us feel anything. We have to look at our own patience. Now this is subtler and harder. Again, ashrams are for weak lovers of the Lord. And our karma will place us where we're supposed to be. So, Brahmacharya, if you're in a relationship, don't cheat. If you're not in a relationship, be prudent. Shraddha, faith. Have faith that it's all going to work out, that you're in the right place. You're under the tutelage of a woman or a man of God. What was the other one? There was Shraddha, Brahmacharya. There was uh, austerity. Yes. Our own tapas. Meaning when the extroversions of the mind come up, drug, sex, and rock and roll, we turn our minds away from this is what Swamiji used to call sublimation, psychological term. Example I like to use, many of you heard me say this before, it's like the college kid, it's Friday night, she's in her dorm room, her friends come by and say, hey, we're going out for pizza and beer, why don't you come with us? And what do you get? FOMO, fear of missing out. But then another idea comes up, no. I've got a paper due on Monday, and I really want to do well in this class. You guys go on without me. So we let go of a lesser desire for a greater desire. So in this world, we begin to let go of ego prompted. Activity. This is what I need in order to be happy. So here, these six youngsters are doing it in the confines of Pipalada's ashram. That's the traditional way. But you and I take up the same practices in the world. You can be a brahmachari in the world. This is your student time. And Pipalada says, do it for a year to see if they are jinyasu, real seekers after knowledge. Mumukshu, a real Half-hearted aspirations will not yield the fruit. Thinking of the person, I really want to play the guitar. I've gone down to the guitar store and I bought a very expensive guitar. I got my book on how to play the guitar. 
and I looked at it for two weeks, and now it sits in the corner. Steadfastness on the path of you. So all of this is implied in this month where the six youngsters stay in the ashram, probably praying and chanting, learning a little Sanskrit if they don't have it. And in the pressure cooker, where the things of this world are removed from their attention. They're no longer worried about politics or the economy or what their family is doing, etc. Any thoughts on this before we move on? All right, next mantra. Atak Kambandhi Katayayan Upeyatya Prapacha Agavan Putoha Va Ima Praja Prajayanta Iti. Then, after a year's stay in the ashrama, Katayayana Kabandhi approached Pipalada and asked, quote, Revered and Venerable Master, whence are these creatures born? It's a good question. So let's back up one. No, that's number three. Oh, was? was? Okay. Yeah, that's right. So after a year, our first student asks this question. All these creatures in the world, the people, animals, all these living beings, how did they get here? Where did they come from? Now, this is a very good and important question. So the materialist would say, Big Bang, it all just works itself out. It's the nature of nature. If we even think from the standpoint of materialism, the very fact that this body itself is really nothing but stardust. Billions of years ago, stars had to go supernova in order to create the heavier elements that eventually come to make up your body. What about metabolism? What's the difference between a rock and even a bacteria, let alone an elephant or a dinosaur or a human being? What is life? Now, Vedanta thunders. Rama Satyam Jagan Mitya. Brahman alone is real. The phenomenal world is an illusion. Sarvam Kalvidam Brahma. All this phenomenal world is Brahman. But, in the long and vivid dream of this world, Mahaswana, the great dream of this world, how did it all come to pass?
So in Gita, Krishna says, knowledge gives you mastery of this world and the beyond. The yogi does not avoid or endeavor to escape from this world. That's not freedom. So what we're going to do is we explore this first question is get an understanding how the infinite Brahman through its Maya Shakti its illusory power brings about this world. Now mind you, the Upanishad is probably Bronze Age. No, I think the 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 uh, most recent commentators, Westerners, will say maybe 500 BCE, and we're going to find some fascinating things which don't come around until. Einstein articulated in this situation. So let's see what happens next month. We're in number four. Yes. Tasmai sa hovacha prajaka mo vai prajapati ni sa Tapyata, sa tapas taptva, sa mithuna, mutya padayate, raim cha pranam, chetiaito, mu bahudha praja, karishyata iti. He replied, quote, Prajapati, the lord of the creatures, decided to perform penance, and having performed penance, he created a pair, matter and energy thinking that together they would, between them, produce create creatures in many ways. So this is allegory. This is why it is pointless for a person to study an Upanishad without a guru, or at least a very good authoritative commentator. So I forget the root. Ja, is that the root? To be born? Yes. There are lots of different words. We have like janma, uh, jati. jati, and here prajapati, meaning the one ultimately who's the cause of all that is born. We could say God, say the Lord, we could say the Creator. <clears throat> We've got different names. We've got Ishwara, the Lord. We've got Brahma, the Creator God. They all are similar, but here the Upanishad uses the word good job. The ultimate grandsire of it all. Meaning the origin of all that is born. And here we're not talking just about living creatures. So Prajapati, who his imagination. Remember our three questions. Who am I? What is this world? How has it come about? So now we're looking at this third question. San Kalpena. By means of San Kalpena. 
how do you translate something? Wish, will, thought, desire, intention. Anybody have any other translations <clears throat> of Sankalpa? Can you think of any? A thought itself. A thought itself. Sometimes in colloquial speech, someone will have a sankalpa, like almost like a New Year's resolution. Mm -hmm. So the deeper meaning of sankalpa. Sankalpa is the word that describes the process whereby a thought, an image, an imagination becomes grossified into something knowable, visible, manifest. So even in the Judeo-Christian tradition, in the beginning, everything was dark and void. And it says darkness was on the face of the deep or the waters. Remember this? Mm -hmm. uh, who are you, David? Yes. That all through Western culture, water is the greatest metaphor for consciousness. So the deep was there before creation. And then what does God do? Does he get out his mud pot to make the world? What's God do? Yeah. Fiat lux. God speaks the world into creation. It's not just speech, it's intention, it's thought. This is all metaphor. It's all metaphor. And there's so much ramification in this. Listen very carefully. Again, in the Hebrew scripture, Hebrew scripture says, God created human beings in his image and likeness. In the image and likeness of him created he them. Foolish people think, oh, God's got two legs and two arms, the head and a long white beard. Doesn't mean that. It means God's nature is things come into existence by means of Sankalpa. You and I, to an enormous degree, recreate the image. We'll get to that. So, Prajapati, creator. That's cute. Meaning is first imagination. Prana Raja. I had to do a little research on this word Raja. It's, I think, very, very. You look it up, it means wealth, stuff. That was another word, uh, translation I got. Did you find any others? Matter was another one. Matter, which is how Swamiji translates. So it means the inert stuff. And then along with the inert stuff matter is prana energy now physics has come to show us 
that matter and energy are just different states of the same thing. The Upanishad doesn't say literally E equals MC squared, but it sure implies it. Rajapati puts forward matter and energy, which are two sides of the same thing. And no matter how far down you go into the microcosm, we find matter and energy always linked, always ultimately just two sides of the same. Well, is prana electromagnetism? No, it's subtler than electromagnetism. Is prana gravitational force? No, it's subtler than gravitational force. I don't know, you guys are scientists. What was the energy that caused, I think the physicist called it, calls it inflation, is that right? After the Big Bang, when it went boom, just a, a few, you know, fractions of a second to like three quarters of its size. What was the energy that did that? Prana's even more subtle. Prana is everywhere. Scientists are now talking about things like dark energy and matter. Our universe is continuing to expand at an accelerating rate. What's either sucking it or pushing it? Can't figure it out. They know it must be there. Prana is even more subtle. So you've got the Rai Prana inert matter and enlivening energy. This divine couple won't work. There's not People up there in the sky doing the mufti mufti. It's not what we're talking about. But that becomes the source. Everything in the phenomenal world that's manifest. What is its cause? Prajapati. Who is Prajapati? Saguna Brahman Brahman with Brahmas. So after we get this divine couple, matter and energy, let's see what happens. Next month. Aditya ha vai prano prai itreva chandama yairva etat sarvam yan murtam cha murtam cha tasman murti treva raihi. The sun is verily the energy and the moon is the matter. All that hath form and all that is formless is matter and therefore form is indeed matter. So this is metaphor. We think of the sun as where energy comes from in our everyday world. Heat and light come from the sun. Here the Rishi is saying the moon is essentially inert. You know, a lot of people in the West thought, oh, the moon 
glows by its own light. Here the inference is, no, nope, its light is reflected from the sun. So these are metaphors for these two things, matter and energy. From it, everything has become. So we go down to the molecular level, electron microscope. And we find atoms are not static. Neutrons, protons, electrons. But they have energy. Even tinier neutrinos. I don't even know what smaller subatomic particles are. But all of them have energy. I was watching one of these YouTube videos about how they've now traced back what they think is the origins of life. After the Earth cooled, like in the first 200 million years after it was first formed, we had the first incidents of the molecular soup starting to form into chains of polymers, the beginnings of life. Metabolic activity. Some of these scientists are saying that it looks like life is the default state in the universe if the environment is conducive. It's just mind boggling if you think about it. What is that life? It's interaction of matter and energy. So, for example, they've begun to discover way down at the very bottom of the ocean, they have these um, smokers which are like uh, sulfuric acid and hot gases and things like that coming from uh, deep within the earth. No light, none at all. And there's life down there. It isn't based on photosynthesis. It's not based, based on the energy of the sun. It uses, uh, I don't know what the word they would have, a chemosynthetic whole other life forms that aren't based on photosynthesis. And then here on the surface of the planet, the incredible miracle of how a leaf can turn the energy of the sun into food, into nutrients. It's a Incredible wedding of the divine couple, matter and energy. Mind you, we're not talking about consciousness yet. Consciousness is both. We're talking about in the phenomenal world itself. So the sun. Aditya, Surya, is the great metaphor for energy, and the moon is the great metaphor for that which is inert, and it's the two 
together. All right, any thoughts on this? Next verse. Next month. Atadithya Udayantat Prachim Disham Pravishati Tena Prachyan Pranan Rashi Mashu Sannidhatte Yadhyakshinam Yadpratichim Yadudichim Yadakho Yadutva Yadantara Disho Yatsarvam Prakashayati Tena Sarvan Pranan Rashi Mashu Sannidhatte Now the sun rising goes towards the east and he embraces with his rays all pranas in the east. When he lights up the southern, the western and northern quarters, the above, the below and the intermediate three quarters and the all, by that he thrills all creatures with his rays. So again, this is metaphor. So the image has been brought from observation. So if you get up before sunrise. It's your job to go out and build the fire in the middle of the village. Getting ready for the ladies to go down to the tank to get water, etc. So we have dawn. What's the difference between dawn and sunrise? Dawn is the pre-sunrise gloaming. The aruna. So if you get up while it's still dark, no sound, no light, then all of a sudden the sky and everything starts to turn a little purple. What happens next? Chirp, 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 chirp. You ever heard that? The birds start? So what uh, the, um, the image that the scripture is saying is in the beginning, the sun starts in the east. And with the rays of the sun, the movement of the world, the light and the color and the activity starts to happen. Of course, as the sun moves across the sky, it moves largely towards the south, the west, the north, in their turn get lighted up and enlivened by energy. So they saw in nature how the solar energy absorbed by the things of this world in so many ways to create this wedding between inert matter and the life. So what's he saying? What's the, the, the teaching that's behind it? It is this prana itself which activates matter. Some sort of energy is necessary. Even in something as simple as a chemical reaction, you need energy to make things happen. Or the inverse. Take a fist-sized bunch of uranium, build a bomb around it, implode everything on it, and an enormous amount of energy that's released. This is the jugget 
the creation. Why do we call it the jungle? Because it's going jungle, 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 jungle. It's always moving. Matter of energy. In the next month, So, Esha, Vaishwanara, Vishwarupa, Pranogni, Rudayate, Tadet, Drachabhya, Yuktam. He is this Vaishnavara, no, sorry, Vaishwanara, the sum total of all living beings. Assuming all forms, Prana is the fire that rises every day. Yes. This has been said in the following mantra of the Rig Veda also. Yes. So let me back up. One of the things that's implied when the sun lights the east, the south, uh, um, the west, and the north is space. So in this interaction of matter and energy, space is created. And again, going back to what we were talking about at the very beginning, the inflation of the phenomenal universe after the Big Bang. This is what the scientists tell us. I don't know if it's true. But first there was a singularity. No time, no space. And then, whoa, we had space. So here this is implied that this is what the divine couple creates is Akash, space. Now, in this verse, read the English again. I'm having a single moment. He is this Vaishvanara, the sum total of all living beings. Assuming all forms, prana is the fire that rises every day. Yes. So, Vishwa Nara. Nara means a person. The person who knows the waking state world. Vaishwanara. So we get this idea. We get this idea that it is sun, meaning the prana, the energy itself that enlivens everything. It is the fire within everything that's cooking everything. Everything. It's what makes everything act in the world. Now, we're going to find the import of this when it has to do with your health, and my health, my sadhana, your sadhana. What is the relationship between prana? What happens to you and me as human beings? That's where he's headed with this discussion. So it shows up as fire. Now, there's a lot of things we can say about that. We can think of fire as the energy source. It's cooking everything. The food is cooked with fire in our tummies. But we can also say that we now have fire as the Tanmatra that rules sight. The world is not just imagined, but it is seen. We can be aware of it. So phenomenal awareness is moving into creation. All right, let's do one more. Vishwarupam Harinam Jata Vedasam Parayanam Jyotirikam Tapantam Sahasra Rashimaha Shatagdha Vartamanaha Pranaha Prajana Mudaya Yesha Suryaha The knowers understand that which is of all forms, the resplendent, the highest goal, the one light, the heat giver, to be the thousand rate rising sun who exists in hundred forms as the life of all creatures. 
So this is a mantra from Veda. And here, what happens is our Rishi, as great teachers do, don't take my word for it. This is what Rig Veda says. So we would know Rig Veda. So it's from mantras such as this that we can begin to get approximate dates for Akarava Veda, or at least this Upanishad. It appears after the Rig Veda. So here he, this is his authority for the same I need. So let's sum up what we've covered. First, means of approach to the teacher. You want to be a jinyasu, a mamukshu. You want to want this. We get tested in the beginning. Are you serious? Are you serious enough to go hang out in an ashram for a year? What's the value of hanging out in the ashram? We get a respite from the triggers that stimulate our vasanas. For those of us who are grahastas in the world, we have to do it ultimately through discipline. Now, don't worry about this, because those who go into the ashram and are temporarily separated from their triggers, guess what happens after their two and a half, three years in the ashram and they go back to the world? Ah! There it is again. Can't run from the world. Can be helpful. So after we've quieted down the mind, then we approach the teacher with the dry wood, with that attitude of surrender. Show me how to burn up my bosses. And then our first question, where did all this come Sarvam Kovidam Brahma. It's all Brahman. But it's not just this nameless sea. We do see Namaru, name and form. So the first manifestation of Maya Shakti is Vijapati, the grandsire of everything, the Brahma, the creator. Ishwara, the Lord. What's the first thing Prajapati does? By means of imagination brings forth matter and energy. Sure. Ultimately, the two elements of what we will later call Prakriti, nature. Nature is both of them. They work together. And the whole phenomenal universe is this interplay between matter and energy. Space is then created. You do this at night when you dream. Where does your dream take place in my mind? But what happens? I was in this great big room inside my mind, so you created space with me. Might be possible. We have the movement of energy in this world enlivening everything. And again, it's going to bring it right down to you and me. That's where he's headed with this. Any thoughts or questions before we end today? So right now, it seems like he's only talking about the phenomenal world. That's true. Like the enlivening principle. This whole first chapter is just the phenomenal world. So it's not the enlivening principle, the ultimate enlivening principle, but it's the relative enlightenment. Yes. Yes. 
ओम पूर्णमदा पूर्णमिद पूर्णा पूर्णमुदक्षते पूर्णस्य पूर्णमादाय पूर्णमेवशिष्यते ओम शांति 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 हरि ओम श्री गुरुख्यो नम हरि ओम